Hello, welcome to the Scroll Ensemble Classical Music Improvisation Channel. I'm Robert. I'm trying out a new format for this video, so let me know if you like it. Today I want to talk about a source, or a book, which is very special to me and has been with me for many years in my improvising and improvisation teaching. It's called L'Art de Préluder, The Art of Preluding, and it was published by Jacques Otter in 1719. Let's very quickly have a little look at who this man was before diving into the source itself. Jacques Martin Otter was part of an important family of instrument makers and wind players. They were highly influential with a successful new design for wind instruments and this auditeur specifically was a successful musician and composer as well. Being the flûte de la chambre de roi was a high position not easily attained. In this video I'm especially interested in auditeur as a teacher. He was very popular with the nobility and consequently could publish several pedagogical titles. For example, he published the first method book for the flute, which was highly influential in his time. You can see the principe here on the left. It contains some interesting ideas for us as well regarding ornamentation and rhythm flexibility. His opus 2, here above in the middle, uh, gives notated examples of how to perform the most common ornaments of Otterterre's time, at least in France. This is a treasure trove for improvisers. Often we're so busy improvising the basic notes of our improvisation that we forget that someone in that time would have immediately also added a layer of ornamentation on top of the ornamented notes. Very interesting is his collection of Air et Brunettes that you can see here at the bottom, which contains famous songs from the time uh, with Otterterre's own ornamentation suggestions and uh, examples of the double form, where one repeats an entire movement or song, but then with ornamentation in faster note values. And Bach loved this idea as well. And I'm hoping to make videos about all of these as well at some point, but, well, do shout in the comments if you want me to do that right now. Let's for now dive into L'Art de Prélude as I promised. This book seems to be quite unique. It is the first in its kind, as even for keyboard instruments, which have a lot of improvisation books, a monograph with this topic had not appeared yet. On top of that, it is the first book devoted to solo improvisation on a melodic instrument, so not talking about things like grounds or diminutions that we have, of course, methods for. And it is a book explicitly linked to the flute, recorder, oboe, and other soprano instruments like the violin. Compared to other earlier method books for wind and string instruments, when it comes to improvisation, there's also much more text explaining the rules and ideas, rather than only a host of examples with a preface. And maybe uh, Simpson is an exception here. We also find many different types of preludes, varied in form, notation, character, meter and key. This method Autotairs is based on the idea of a canvas, which can be filled in with the exact characteristics then needed by the performer in the moment. Finally, there are also chapters that explain several necessary concepts in a quite in-depth way, like modulation, meter and transposition. Otter starts the preface off by saying that in fact he doesn't need to explain what a prelude is, because everyone already knows this. Still. A century later, Dopra talks about a veritable mania for preluding in his horn method. So apparently the use of preludes in this time was near universal. Of course, we don't live in that world anymore. So I looked at musical dictionaries around that time uh, to give us a bit more context that we are apparently missing as to what a prelude is. Only Rousseau really talks about it in his Dictionnaire. It's a bit later the dictionary than uh, Autotair's prelude method, but I think it's still representative, since Rousseau also talks about the two types that are mentioned below. So Rousseau writes, to prelude is, in general, to sing or play some stroke of irregular fantasy, rather short, but passing by the essential chords of the tone, either to establish or to dispose the voice 
or to place the hand well on an instrument before the beginning of a piece of music. So basically to warm up or to establish the key that you're going to play in the, the real piece of music that is about to happen. Um, Otterterre goes on to talk about two different types of preludes, also, as I said, mentioned by Rousseau. One is composed and essentially a part of the character pieces, like the Allemande and Sarabande, but you can also find it in opera or uh, cantatas. And the other type of prelude is called prelude caprice, and this Otterterre calls the real prelude, which is, of course, improvised. He also refers to the seeming contradiction between a book, his book, describing rules for preludes and the prelude being a genre which seems ruleless and free. Of course, within all this freedom, as Otterterre says, the rules of composition still apply, especially when it comes to being able to stay in a particular key as related to the composition you are pre preluding before. Another way in which Otterterre distinguishes between preludes is whether they are measured or not. There are ones that have bar lines, like most of our modern printed music does now, and you can see an example of this here in the second prelude where it says mesuré, or measured. But there are also some that only have a little stub where the bar line should be. Um, as you can see here in the first prelude, and I made these little circles here in case you hadn't seen that yet. Otterterre just says in chapter 11 that this difference exists, but doesn't explain what this means practically, whether one is maybe freer or something like that. In chapter 3 there is a rather cryptic remark. Even when there are bar lines, he says, we don't have to keep to a regular tempo to beat time. And then he says, but this is the case when you want to play them from memory. So is there then in fact any difference between the bar lines written or just marked with the stubs? I think that the bar lines are there to help you practice and understand the music. But then when you perform a prelude, whether one by Otterterre or an improvised one based on his ideas, you'll probably play them more freely. I would make a distinction between preludes that are really free and preludes that are still more or less measured. This is also reflected in the characters chosen for them. For example, the second prelude depicted here is a gay, a happy allegro type movement, so it makes sense to keep the freedom a bit more at bay. On the other hand, the first prelude has tendrement, or tender, as a character marking. Here I would really play or improvise from the effect and only see the rhythmical outline as a sketch. A final tangential remark on all of this, it is interesting that Otterterre mentions memorization, which may be a hint at a very useful tool for learning to improvise. Memorize and transpose these preludes to build up your memory bank of possibilities. Um, finally, I wanted to say, do let me know if you think I made any mistakes in the translation here or also in other moments where I have some doubts. Um, I would love to know that and I will keep commentary up also in the comments below this video in case I come to new insights or someone has brilliant ideas. Otterterre is not the only one having preludes with and without bar lines. Many prelude collections just publish preludes without bar lines, but a combination of the two is rarer. Here you can see a collection popular with horn players by one of my favorite composers, Jacques-François Gallet. He wrote some wonderful preludes and some of them are indeed with bar lines and some without. Another element in Otterterre's L'Art de Prélude is the Très. There are two chapters devoted to this, and I'm not completely certain what Otterterre means with this idea. In modern French, Très means a word for an excerpt, in orchestral excerpts, at least in music. And in the 19th century, the Très are clearly related to etudes. Um, often the word seems to mean something like a difficult passage. Otterterre introduces the idea of Très with the following text at the start of chapter 4. My intention has been to char characterize them in the manner of the capriccio, produced when one is, so to speak, merely playing around on the instrument. 
As they are only detached pieces, they can be started with other notes than those of the key of the piece. I will include a few difficult ones which will serve properly only for study. I think there are two ways to understand this. One would be that these traits are a type of prelude akin to the caprice. Many authors, but Czerny most clearly, designates this caprice as the freest form of improvisation, as if just playing around on the instrument, with musical ideas streaming directly into the improvisation or the instrument perhaps. This to me sounds very much like Otto Ter's description of merely playing around in the manner of caprice. And then he also mentions that there are some harder ones which are aimed at practice, like etudes. So there might be two versions. On top of that, indeed, some traits have the title etude, but then are the others not etudes or are these the specifically difficult ones? But then, you know, if you look at this one on page 22 here at the bottom of the PowerPoint, um, it's not actually particularly difficult in any way, I would think. Neither the key, nor the fast notes, nor any particular thing that we really seem to be practicing. At the same time, many of the traits are not particularly adventurous, and so they may just all be etudes in the shape of little caprice. In that case, they can be started with other notes might rather mean that you can play these etudes starting from different notes at est, transpose them to practice them in all the keys. There are two entire chapters of tre, one for flute and one for recorder, and I think for our modern purposes we can use these in both ways. Some of them are great etudes and teach us to use figuration that is super useful in improvising preludes, and at other times, some of the stranger traits can also inspire us for our improvisations in terms of form, use of meter, etc. Here I've added three traits for you to see. Um, at the first place is the etude type. I think it's pretty clear with all the repeated 16s in these arpeggio figurations. It is also interesting to note how it seems to resemble a rule of the octave exercise from Partimento. And you can watch some videos about that here through this link. The second trait seems most interesting to me in terms of articulation, the form and the rondement designation, all of which are rare in the other preludes. Um, especially the word pique I did not see anywhere else. Well, the third one may kind of speak for itself. It's in 316. There's no other prelude or any piece like this. He also writes this badine at the beginning, which is the word he uses for playing around on the instrument um, when he's introducing the idea of tre. So this seems to be very specifically this kind of caprice-like piece. And then he also changes after like seven bars and an upbeat to the a meter in two with a rather different kind of figuration. And then it's just over. So I think this is quite a capricious little tre. Otto Ter calls all improvised preludes prelude caprice, in contrast to the composed preludes. However, at the end of his book, he publishes two larger preludes going through all the keys. Otto Ter says these are rather exceptional, as one wouldn't usually go through all the keys. Well, there's also, of course, an accompaniment, as you can see, and they are much longer than his other preludes. But I think he implies the possibility here of a slightly different type of prelude, a longer, freer type especially when we consider that his book is meant for amateur musicians and professional musicians probably would have been able to improvise such an extended prelude. Some more substantiation for such an idea comes in my eyes from Rousseau's further description of the prelude from his Dictionnaire and Pierre Bayot's influential 1834 violin method. Of course, these excerpts are both later and don't talk about wind instruments uh, specifically. Um, but here comes the question again, whether perhaps what we've learned in Otter only applies to amateurs and these other books refer also to practices performed by professionals, as uh, Rousseau also talks about the three most prominent prelude improvisers on keyboard instruments, which were evidently professionals. And he says the art of preluding is more considerable on keyboard instruments and it is to compose and play extempore, which means to improvise pieces, filled with all that composition has most ingenious in design, in fugue, in imitation, modulation and harmony. 
it is chiefly in preluding that great musicians, exempted from that extreme slavery to rules, ravish the ear of the audience. So the prelude also seems to be a special place, like Czerny talks about Fantasia and Caprice, a special place where the musician can prove their amazingness. Now I'm going to talk through the chapters of Otter's book, logically starting with chapter one. Otter's main goal is to cover some basic ground so you will understand his terminology in the following chapters. Also, we're introduced to the very start and the very end of the prelude, so that in fact the main framework for our prelude improvisation is already in place. So first we're introduced to the scale, something you've probably seen before. Autotaire numbers each degree, as we also do nowadays, so that he can refer to it easily. And he also mentions that these degrees have another characteristic, besides their number or interval, namely whether between one degree and the next is a whole step or a half step. You probably already know that there is a half step between degree 3 and 4, between the B and the C, and between degree 7 and 8, the F sharp and the G. And between the other degrees, there is always a whole step. And these half and whole steps define the sound of this key. All of this is important because for a successful prelude or indeed any type of improvisation, we must know which key we're in and we must be able to remain in this key as long as we want or need to. The most basic prelude is simply a few notes of the key of the real piece, maybe even just the one, the three, five and back to the one. Otter goes on to say that preludes should end with the first degree, which you can see in this beautiful oval here, um, and a prelude mostly starts there as well, but it can also start on the third or fifth degree. Here is an example of such a prelude. You can see uh, written by Otter, it starts on the fifth degree, the D in G minor, and it ends on the G, the first degree in G minor. So basically, Autotaire says preluding simply consists of making such a beginning, one, three or five, traveling from note to note in the key you have chosen, and then ending with the right note, in other words, the tonic. So when Autotaire says that a tre can start on another degree than the usual first, third or fifth, this is in contrast to these remarks here about preludes. In chapter two, Autotaire explains the use of the canvas, and this is the basic premise of his pedagogy. It is a sort of skeleton, or perhaps a guideline, which you can use each time you improvise a prelude. But each time you dress it up differently by simply adding some different notes or figuration between each of the notes of the canvas. Although Otter doesn't exactly say this, the canvas itself can also be changed and improvised in the moment. For example, in a simpler way as skipping certain notes or repeating them or making them longer. Many of the examples in Otter's book indeed use the canvas principle, but not as literally as going through each step of the canvas you can see here. Despite what Otter may have you believe in this chapter, because he does say, now you basically know everything. When we look at Otter's first example prelude, or as he calls it, variation, we already see many elements of his pedagogy. We see a canvas that is used more freely. We see how the canvas is ornamented. We see the final cadence and the musical ideas possible, even within such simple confines. I will discuss each element in more detail now. Let's first talk about the canvas. At the bottom here, you can see the canvas that Otter showed us on the previous page. In the middle, I've noted the, the version of his canvas, which I think Otter used for this prelude. We can see that Otter used all the notes in the same order, but changed the original canvas in terms of its rhythm. As we will see in later examples as well, Otter especially accentuates the first and fifth degrees by making them a bit longer. Then we can look at how Otter ornamented the canvas, which mostly comes down to filling up the gaps between the canvas notes, like sand between the toes. I've kept the canvas notes here in a sort of purple, or apparently it's called blueberry, so you know that, and then the black notes are the added ornamented notes in between the canvas notes. The second idea in ornamentation continues this scalar idea, but instead of going up continuously, Otter rather ornaments the D itself, 
with the third above and jumps back to the D, thereby really clearly marking this D as a longer note in the canvas. That also makes this canvas note take longer than the ones before. Beautifully, he then repeats this ornamentation, but using the next two canvas notes in bar two. Now, note how our highest canvas note is unornamented. We really arrive there. It stands proudly at the top and is made much longer than the other canvas notes. This note is then even sort of extended by the rest that comes next. So we still have that D in our ears. Then I love how Ottetera goes down the scale. By moving the entire scale to the offbeat, the simple scale gets a slightly different character from when it was used on the way up in bar one. This is then wonderfully repeated the bar after, reminding us of the repeat of the figure in bar one and two. Finally, we have a cadence finale to really finish the prelude. In most preludes, this cadence takes the shape of two dotted quarter notes and the trill, as you can see here. The trill is so typical for the cadence that in French, the word cadence became synonymous with trill, and several 19th century authors complain about this fact. But anyway, finally, we have a wonderful concise prelude, which despite its unity, is also varied at every little corner. In variation two, I think Auditeur is trying to teach us that small differences can make for a rather different prelude. So he kind of uses more or less the same canvas and also focuses on these eighth notes, but still it's rather different from our first variation. The obvious change is the big slurs going over bars uh, at a time. But there are other changes that make this its own prelude, starting with an upbeat instead of the on the beat, a different variation of the canvas, ever so slightly, and no rests or longer notes, no real cadence with trill at the end, and a different ornamentation, although rather subtly. In variation three, the changes are more obvious. Ottoter teaches us that we can also change meter, and that the ornamentation can be quite elaborate and even arpeggiated, although some of these may suggest some actual different canvas being used. In this case, because it's the variation of the actual canvas that we saw before, we know for sure that Ottoter wants this canvas. The fourth variation then starts looking very much like what I would call typical French music from this period, with its focus on small ornaments and rhythmic diversity. Ottoter himself also coins it with ornaments, so apparently the variations up till now were more like melodic elaborations, and here we have the typical French ornaments like the trills, the mordants, etc. Maybe finally a complete piece. Personally, I had some trouble identifying the canvas in this, especially in the second line. If we are still really varying the canvas that he gave us at the beginning, I feel like Ottoter used it very loosely here, since the B and the G here are just tucked away in the middle, and we would expect canvas notes to fall on important parts of the bar, like the first and third beat as they have in earlier examples. So maybe this wasn't actually the canvas that he was thinking of when he wrote this. Perhaps, as we can see here in the second bit, maybe the canvas was going to the A and the F sharp, which also would be very logical in G. We're then ref referencing D major as a dominant to come back to a, a real final cadence. Ottetera also gives us a second canvas, which passes through each degree of the scale. And I suppose we could also make our own canvases. Here, Ottetera shows us a different approach to preluding. While on the previous canvas, we found quite some variation in ornamentation, going from one canvas note to the next. Here, Ottetera uses the same motif on each new note as you can see in each variation. Then in his fifth and sixth variation, when he's going down, he uses another motive, but yet again, the same motive for each scale degree. Inspired by Professor Jerdingen, who draws a parallel between music and the fine arts in his book Child Composers in the Old Conservatories, I found a parallel in the usage of a canvas or skeleton in drawing published around the same time as Ottetere's L'Art de Prélude. Although the instructions don't use the word canvas directly, 
I think it's clear that uh, the same approach is used. On the left, we see a canvas for a face from a method by Jean Berg, which can then be dressed up and literally personalized in the character that you want to draw. On the right, you see Lebrun's method instructing how to draw different emotions. He boils down the emotion to its drawn essence, which then we can use to learn and use as a canvas for our future drawings. Now that all the basic principles are clear, Autotera goes on to give a host of examples. The book is on IMSLP and you can find a link to it in the description. Careful though, the examples are noted in French G clef, which has the same effect as our modern bass clef. So the first note in the first G major prelude here is a B. Autotera discusses how the preludes can be played on the various instruments, oboe, flute or recorder, and also gives some hints as to some ossias and sign for that. Autotera's examples are truly wonderful and show different kinds of modulation, meters, even like 916, meter changes and especially a lot of different characters, which give so much inspiration for our own improvisations. I will now describe the other chapters of the book, which are related to prelude improvisation, but more on the side of the topic. But first, I'd like to invite you to join my Autoter Prelude course. Here, I made a little overview of all the wonderful characters that I've been looking at. This is not the complete thing yet, but if you do my course, you get to know all about that. In my course, you will learn about using the canvases, how to analyze them, and Autotera's prelude so you can improvise your own. Then you will look at typical features Autotera discusses, such as figuration, ornamentation, modulation, character, meter, and more. And all of this is done in a friendly and safe environment. We will learn step by step, starting from the level you are at, whether that is at the very beginning or already more advanced. Autotera starts this important chapter off by talking about the leading tone. It is the seventh degree of the scale, and what is important is that it has the function of leading us back to the tonic. As you probably know, the eighth degree is the same as the first degree, in this case both a G, and so that is the tonic. This leading back happens especially because between the seventh and eighth degree is a half step, and we feel that half step is very leading. Later on, Autotere shows these two little musical phrases, which start off the same but end radically differently, because of introducing the leading note or not. For example, the first one... ...ends in G, but when instead of this F-sharp we play an F, we end in C. As you probably know, in a minor scale, the 6th and 7th degree are raised when going up and are half a tone lower when going down. Autotera mentions that sometimes this is not quite the case when you are not going down far enough. The details of this go a bit beyond the scope of this video, I think, which is already quite long. Uh, but here, if you are really into that kind of thing, here's the paragraph. You can have a look at it. Or alternatively, if um, this is all French to you, haha, <laughs> then do ask in the comments and I'll add an addendum. Now Autotera is ready to introduce actual modulation itself. With this example, he starts off with a motif in G major, which is developed by moving each repeat up in the scale and eventually speeding it up till we arrive at the trill on the B here. Uh, this is a cadence but with the third, so as we will see in the next chapter, it's slightly suspended rather than giving us the sense that we're really finished. Then with this lovely scalar figure, Autoter introduces the C sharp, which is the seventh degree of D major and thus its leading tone. Simply by introducing it and sticking to it, we're modulating to our new key, which we can finish with the red cadence in D here. As we shall also see later, D major being the fifth degree, it makes a lot of sense to modulate here in a piece in major. 
Now next we will make a little detour to C major. First thing out of the D major cadence, the C is immediately not sharp anymore, indicating that we are moving away from D. In this case, this is implemented by introducing the F natural, which is very important in this modulation because you may have already realized the leading tone for C is the B, the B natural, but we've already had that B natural all the way through our prelude. So introducing this B again will not actually give us the sense that we're modulating to C. Uh, rather, the F does. After a proper cadence in C, in the green notes here, we swiftly move back to G major by introducing the F sharp almost immediately after the C cadence, which is then finished off by a cadence in the G in the color brown. Uh, the color coding is mine, by the way, that's not in the Otter book. In chapter 8, Otter discusses the different types of cadences. I'm not quite sure why he first spoke about modulation and only then about the different types of cadences, but there you have it. Music, and thus also preludes, can be thought of as playing from one cadence, resting point, to the next, until one reaches the final cadence. In a way, this sounds logical, but interestingly, often when we start improvising, we're so busy with the road and all the notes that we need to do that we forget where that road should or could actually lead. Otter also gives an overview of all kinds of ways to cadence, as you can see here, which is again a wonderfully helpful repository for our improvisations. So the perfect cadence looks like this, where the melody and the bass if there is one, will end on the first degree of the key, often led there by the leading tone, the seventh degree, but not necessarily as we could see with the previous cadence examples. An imperfect cadence is basically a cadence which doesn't quite follow these rules. Any of the following things may be the case. As you can see here below, the bass may not move from the fifth to the first degree, but rather, for example, from the fifth to the sixth degree. And as we can see in this example from Otto Ter's book, from Lulis Thézé, the leading tone may not be sharpened, and still we have a sense of finishing there. Also, a new key might be introduced rather suddenly, leaving you and your audience surprised. Otter discusses two more ideas. Firstly, when using a perfect cadence, the melody could end on the third degree rather than the first, which will leave the melody feeling suspended rather than finished. In this example, we can see the note E instead of the C. So the C might sound like this. But with the E, we feel like it hasn't quite finished yet. Then sometimes we might feel like we're playing a cadence, but in fact that is not what is happening in the music. And according to Otter, these might be moments of true genius. But in my personal experience, sometimes they can also just be very annoying, make the music feel short-breathed, or just mean that you're totally lost. There could be quite a few cadences and imperfect cadences in your preludes. There aren't really any rules for this, except that you try and listen to yourself and assess in the moment what you think will work. You could also record yourself and then later realize, ooh, shouldn't have done that, or that was amazing. Now we've learned about cadences and about modulation. Now Otter zooms out and shows us which degrees it would be typical to modulate to, depending on whether you're in a major or minor key. It is interesting to note that these modulations can be found actually in most Baroque music and that most pieces will only modulate to about two different keys. So you don't have to modulate to all of these as Otter has already stated before. This is an interesting chapter in principle, but sadly not as helpful as it promises to be. The question of how to recognize the key of a piece is of course very important and many people have asked me in the past and when we're improvising a prelude before a particular piece we should know what key it is in uh, to prelude for that particular key. Otter himself admits that truly being able to recognize a composition's key 
in all cases, requires one to be well versed in the language of music. However, he does give some pointers as to how to get started when you don't already know all of that. If you want to skip this bit, I would totally understand. There are timestamps in the description so you can just move on to the next bit. So the first idea that he gives is a piece should start with either the tonic third or fifth of the key. And so that means if the composer does indeed do that, you would be able to recognize the key of the piece by just looking at that. Here we can see one of um, Otto Ter's examples. So just a question for you, which degree does this piece start with? If we are indeed in C major, as you can see here, is it the fifth, third or the tonic? Or another one. No, it's not another one. It is, in fact, the fifth degree. You probably saw that even just by recognizing it. Um, but wait a minute. If you don't know which key we're in yet, after all, that's the point of this exercise. You don't know yet that it's C major. Then the G at the start of the piece might as well be the tonic of G major or the third of E flat major. In this particular example, we can recognize the C major triad, G, E, C, at the beginning of the melody. So we can be quite certain that this piece is indeed in C major, starting on that fifth degree. If you know which note is the leading note, you can also recognize the key from that. It's also, again, a little bit vague, as there are, might be different modulations. Um, in our earlier example, we might recognize the F sharp, uh, as the leading tone. First of all, you could recognize it from the sharpened note, from the sharp figure itself. You may also recognize it from the sharp in the key signature. However, if a key doesn't have a sharp or many sharps, this method kind of stops working. Sometimes you could recognize it also from the note that you trill on just before the cadence, as it often is the uh, leading tone. But as you can see here, uh, in fact, we have the trill on the A, the second degree, which is not the leading tone in this music, um, and thus could be rather confusing. Strangely, the methods I was taught when I was younger, the methods for recognizing the key, are only mentioned last by Ottertair. Those methods are to look at the key signature and to look at the final note. Ottertair has some rather derogatory terminology for this last idea, saying that some people just happen to approach music superficially and are happy to just look only at the final notes. Also, looking at the key signature is not always a success, especially in early music, as especially keys with flats will often be written with one flat fewer in the key signature. For example, C minor, which nowadays has three flats, might be written with two flats, and the third flat would then just be written in the music whenever it occurs. But not always. So Ottertair says, with two flats in the key signature, you are not certain whether it's G minor or C minor. Perhaps combining all of these methods, you might nevertheless end up with the right answer. Ottertair spends quite a bit writing about different clefs and transpositions in chapter 10. Transposing motifs, fully written out music and improvisations into different keys is a vital part of learning to improvise. But Ottertair's text doesn't actually deal with this aspect of transposition, and so I will not really talk more about this chapter. It is a wonderful exercise, though, to improvise a prelude and try to improvise the same prelude in another key, um, or even just learn um, or play one of Ottertair's and try to transpose it to as many keys as you can. In the coming days, I will put some little exercises from Ottertair up, so we can both practice uh, transposition and maybe also use them for some little preludes as well. Finally, Ottertair discusses different meters. Just as a short explanation, meter is described by the symbol uh, before the music and defines how many of a particular note value fit into a bar. Here in blue you see 3-4, which means three quarter notes in the bar. 
Although Otto Terrace is more of a theoretical explanation, it is still very interesting for us improvisers, especially in a free improvisation genre as the prelude. Firstly, it helps define the basic structure of our improvisation right from the bat. So it's much easier to get started when you know you have to play three beats in a bar uh, worth an eighth note than to just jump in not knowing what you'll do and when maybe the next bar will occur swimming along. Meter can also be used to vary more between one prelude and the next. By its very nature, a prelude in 3-4 just can't be the same as a prelude in 2, even if you use almost the same kind of ideas. On top of that, Otter relates these meters to particular characters or genres of music. This means that the meter immediately comes with a set of helpful characteristics to further detail your improvisation, and a set of options to further vary your improvisations. So if you're playing 3-2 with the slow beats, then it's usually very pathetic or tender music, already two choices. But then you could also choose a sommeil, which is like a sort of typical French opera piece describing the sleep, or it might be part of a cantata or a grave, or even a courant for dancing. So you can see how these ideas can rigorously improve the scope of choices that you might have. Otter also defines which notes are inégal, which is a kind of note length inequality like swing in jazz. Many more gradients and subtleties seem to exist than just one note is longer than the other. But at least Otter gives us a great way into the topic by staying simple and practical. It's interesting as well to look at defined speeds for each meter, especially when this music is not your daily bread. This can be quite helpful as a starting point. So I've made this table uh, with an overview of the information, most of which you can screenshot here. There's a little bit more on the second page. If you'd like the full document, and so you can just like, you know, print it off and hang it in your bedroom, you can download it from our Patreon as a nice PDF, where you can get extras every month. And you also, of course, help us by supporting us to make more videos. Hopefully you enjoyed this video and this new format. Let me know your thoughts in the comments and feel free to ask any questions. And of course, like, share, subscribe. All of that helps a lot. Thanks so much and see you in the next one.